So this chapter deals with the study of porosity and pore structure. Now you know that we have been dealing with cementitious materials and in general any construction material is a porous solid, right. The pore sizes and the distribution of the pores in the volume of the material has a lot of significance with respect to the kind of performance exhibited by these materials. So we need to look at techniques where we can actually assess the extent of porosity that is available in the system and the distribution of different pore sizes that govern the behavior of such materials in different environments. So porosity and pore structure both obviously affect the density of the material and in terms of construction materials we are interested in understanding the permeability because permeability is the driving factor which leads to the increase of aggressive species and water from the external environment into the concrete that leads to other types of deterioration. So porosity and permeability are two very important characteristics with respect to construction materials and we need to characterize the materials to assess their pore structure which controls both these parameters. So what are the different types of pores that you can find in your system, okay. Uh, first of all, what is the distinction between a pore and a void? Generally when we refer to the term void, we refer to a three dimensional entity in the system. Of course that does not mean pore is two dimensional, but by three dimensional we mean that there is a finite size to a void, whereas a pore can be of a length scale that is much larger as, as opposed to a void which is of a very small finite length scale, okay. Now while I say that, I should also tell you that a discrete entity in the system is generally usually termed as a void, whereas an entity which is more or less continuous in the system is a pore. So generally the definition most commonly accepted for an interstitial void or an interstices is an opening in a rock or a soil or other solids that is not occupied by solid matter. So truly speaking a pore also falls into the category of a void, but for purposes of distinction we generally refer to voids as the three dimensional spaces that are created in the system which have a finite size in all three directions. A pore on the other hand can have an almost infinite size in one direction whereas in the other direction it is either circular or square or rectangular whatever the shape of the pore may be or irregular, right. But in the third direction it is almost an indefinite connection of different small spaces which leads to a channel being formed in your solid, okay. So those pores based on the diameters or size of the openings can be characterized as macro pore where the diameter is greater than 50 nanometers, okay. We are talking about still macro pore but greater than 50 nanometers. Mesopore which is between 2 and 50 nanometers and micro pore, sorry the spelling mistake here, micro pore which is a pore diameter less than 2 nanometers. Now again we say micro but actually it is in nano scale, the pore diameter is in the nano scale ranges. The pore diameter is a diameter in a model in which pores are assumed to be cylindrical. Now you may have irregular shaped pores also, right. What you need to do is convert this irregular shape pore by taking measurements to an equivalent diameter. So if you convert this to an equivalent circle, what would be the diameter of the circle? Basically that represents the pore diameter. Pore volume is basically or specific pore volume is pore volume per unit mass of the material. Overall pore volume is the volume of open pores unless otherwise stated. Now what is an open pore and a closed pore? An open pore or a cavity or a channel which has access to the external surface. So in terms of porous solids like aggregate or concrete, these are the pores that are open to interests of moisture from the outside. Whereas a closed pore is a cavity with no access to the external surface. So you may have a solid, right, in which you have a lot of porosity which has connection to the external surface and so on, but there may be also smaller voids and pores which are inside the volume of the solid which do not have any access to the external surface. So an open pore is here and that is basically your closed pore. In some cases you have pores which are called ink bottle pores. So what is the shape of an ink bottle? Okay, Many of you probably are not even aware of ink bottles because you may not have used ink bottles in your student life, but in our student life the ink bottle was an inseparable entity. We used to carry our 
ink pens and the ink bottle for any examination and whenever the ink gets over we need to actually draw the ink from the bottle. So, the ink bottle looks like this right you have a diameter which is small on the top and a diameter which is larger at the bottom. So, now what will happen if you consider this to be a pore ok supposing a fluid has to actually penetrate this pore it has to penetrate with a pressure that is equivalent to the smaller diameter, but once it crosses that it will suddenly fill up a very large volume because the pressure to cross this diameter right is much greater than the pressure required to fill up the smaller diameter. You know very well that the pressure is inversely proportional to the diameter we will come to that that is basically the basis of your mercury intrusion porosimetry experiment. So, again that is called an ink bottle pore when you have a large pore that is having a smaller pore at its opening. So, an open pore with a narrow neck that is an ink bottle pore ok. So, how do we determine density of porous materials we know that there is no unique value because there is no way that we can actually completely remove the solid part and completely remove the pores and quantify both right. So, we go with different types of estimates we have the bulk specific gravity or density we have the saturated su surface dry value we have the apparent density which is closest to the true density and then we have the true density which is nothing but the mass of the solid in the material divided by volume of the solid. Because your porous solid is a mixture of pores and solids the true density is nothing but the mass of the solid by the true volume of the solid. Now, if you take an aggregate piece how do you determine the true volume of the solid you cannot even when it is dry you have porosity inside no you have the volume of the air and water that is present in the system ok. So, the that is why we come close to it by calculating the apparent density which is the mass of the solid divided by the volume of solid plus volume of air that is in the system ok. But then for the most part we use the bulk density which is the mass of the solid by total volume this total volume is obviously volume of solid plus volume of air plus volume of water this volume of water is the volume that fills up from the accessible porosity of the surface of the voids. What about SSD it is basically wet mass divided by total volume ok. So, as you go from bulk to true what happens to your density increases your density increases. Now, this you have already done in your basic construction materials courses. So, I will not really touch upon how you measure the density, that is something you all know very well. We can measure the density using a pycnometer, right, or we can measure density using the suspended mass or suspended mass method, right, applying Archimedes principle, right. So, we will not go through that. What we will try to do now is try to see how do we assess beyond the accessible porosity can we actually determine what is the network of this porosity which causes the absorption of the moisture or other aggressive chemicals into the material ok. So, we are worried more about the pore size distribution. So, pore volume is not a very good indicator of the material, but the pore size distribution is the parameter that we look want to look at for its significance in relating to the other characteristics or performance of the construction material. So, there are different methods which can be used to assess pore size distribution one is radiation scattering. Now, what is radiation scattering if you have radiation like x ray which is interacting with your material we know that part of this x ray gets rebounded part of it gets absorbed some of it may get transmitted when it gets transmitted it will get scattered ok. So, by looking at the extent of scattering that happens in a porous system we can try to understand the pore size distribution of the material of course, but what happens is although we can resolve very small sizes using radiation scattering it is a very difficult experiment to perform. So, we want to actually look at easier methods one of those is vapor condensation you have learnt earlier about the use of the BET technique to determine the surface area of powders. Now, please remember in that same technique you can also determine the surface area of the open porosity that is present inside the system because the vapor will start condensing on all surfaces that are available in your system. So, if you want to say determine the porosity or pore size distribution 
in a solid chunk of concrete which has a lot of these interconnected pores, you will actually start depositing the vapor or condensing the vapor in those locations also. There will be adsorption happening on the surfaces of your pores also. So, the amount of adsorption will be related to the overall surface area that is available inside the system. That is how we calculate the fineness of very fine powders for instance using the BET method. But the same technique can be modified to actually obtain the surface area of the porosity that is present in your system and lead you to determine the pore size distribution also. But again that is an indirect method of determining your pore size distribution. That is a good method to detect the amount of reactive surface that is available for instance. But for determining pore size distribution maybe it is a very indirect measurement. The direct measurement for P PSD or pore size distribution is mercury intrusion porosimetry. Now of course, the term mercury intrusion porosimetry deals with the penetration of mercury into porous solids which determines the pore structure of these porous solids. But the first question is why do we use mercury? Sorry? No, mercury relatively has a larger sized particle as compared to or atomic size of mercury is much larger as compared to other commonly known species like moisture for instance, water for instance, right? Mercury has a much larger size particle. But there is a characteristic of mercury which makes it very suitable for such measurements. Okay, it does not react definitely. In porous systems like concrete or rock or brick, mercury will not react definitely. What else is the main characteristic which leads it? It does not wet the surface. Mercury has a non-wetting characteristic. Okay, so, this way we are able to fill the pores without any adherence to the pore surface. Okay. So, it directly simply fills the pore without getting adhered to the pore surface. So, that is a very positive thing for us because all we need to do is keep on applying more and more pressure with which the mercury will penetrate smaller and smaller porosity in your system. So, intrusion of mercury into a porous structure and under stringently controlled pressures is basically your mercury intrusion porosimetry. So, all you need to do is simply push mercury into a pore space. If you use water, there will be absorption of water directly by the pores. But mercury, even if you put a block of concrete on mercury, it is not going to go in. It needs some pushing. It needs to be pushed under pressure. Yes. Sir, it won't open the that we will discuss later. Yeah. It is a valid question. Would not mercury open the pores? Well, yes and no. I will come back to that later. So, higher pressure of pushing obviously indicates a smaller pore size. We know that the pore pressure is related inversely to the diameter of the pore. You have done the capillary rise experiment before. You know that the lower the diameter, the higher the capillary rise. Obviously, higher capillary rise means higher pore pressure. right? So, pore pressure is related to these factors. One is gamma which is surface tension of the liquid and theta which is the contact angle that the liquid makes with the surface. Now, theta has a negative sign for a non-wetting case or cos theta sorry, cos theta has a negative sign for a non-wetting case. Why? Sorry? Angle made by the surface is obtuse not acute. Okay. So, the equation is for MIP is quite similar to your capillary rise equation, the Laplace equation that we typically use for capillary rise. The Washburn equation is actually quite similar to that. So, Kepler, uh, I mean Laplace equation is again using uh, radius instead of diameter and because of that this becomes a 2 rather than a 4. right? So, you get the same sort of an equation with Laplace with the capillary rise equation also. So, in general what is happening in this experiment is you have mercury which is pushed into the porous system under pressure and mercury under an ex external pressure P will resist any entry into the pores which are smaller than the particular size D governed by this equation. So, if your diameter that you need to intrude is 1 micron, the pressure that you need, you need to apply will be directly determined from this equation. But if you have pores larger than this D, the mercury will easily enter the pores at that pressure. So, if you keep changing the pressure, you will be penetrating pores that are smaller and smaller. Keep increasing the pressure, you penetrate pores that are smaller and smaller 
and by assessing the pressure or conversely the diameter of penetration, you can now get a pore size distribution of your system. Now again just to refresh your memory on contact angle, this is the angle of contact of the liquid water vapor surface to the liquid uh, uh, to the solid vapor surface at the point. So again here for example, when you have this droplet of liquid sitting on a solid surface, there are different forces that are acting. You have the surface tension of the solid liquid interface, you have the surface tension of the solid vapor interface and surface tension of the liquid vapor interface. Now depending upon the relative surface tension values, you can actually get a characteristic of the droplet to be wetting or non-wetting. In the case of water, what will happen? The surface tension of the solid liquid interface will govern much more and the droplet will simply spread across. Okay, it will just spread across. So when the sum of the vectors equals 0, you have equilibrium that is occurring and the spreading ceases. So in such cases, for example, if you drop mercury on a solid surface, what happens? It does not spread, right? it does not spread. So it has a state which is non-wetting. So how do you make this table surface non-wetting even to water? We coat it with a varnish, right? we, we put varnish on tables and then it becomes non-wetting. Of course, non-wetting of a wood also implies that you increase the lifetime of the wood because only by wetting you decrease the properties of wood. right? So again the contact angles for wetting liquids are acute and for non-wetting liquids the contact angles are obtuse. So this is a typical mercury intrusion peroximeter. Okay? So this is a system from Micrometrics, which is a very popular instrument across the world and this is something that we have in our lab, it is uh, from Thermo Scientific. It is called the Pascal 140 and 440 series from Thermo Scientific. Now the concept is quite similar, you have two ports, you have a low pressure port and a high pressure port. So we know that our porous materials have a range of pore sizes. Okay? Some of those do not need a very high degree of pressure to be filled. But some pores which are extremely small need extremely high pressures for filling. Okay? So generally what happens is you have low pressure ports located separately and then the high pressure ports also located separately. So again this Pascal system also has the low pressure and high pressure systems presented separately for the instrument. Okay? So first you start off by using your sample inside the low pressure port. So where you evacuate and create a vacuum like condition so that you are starting off with very small pressures and then you are pushing mercury at those pressures. Okay? Once you come out to the atmospheric pressure, you then remove the sample from the low pressure port and put it inside the high pressure port where you start applying pressure beyond the atmospheric to all the way up to about 60,000 psi. So 60,000 psi is almost equal to about 400 megapascals. So the pressure applied in the high pressure port can go all the way up to about 400 megapascals and this 400 megapascal corresponds roughly to about 2 to 3 nanometer sized pores, 2 to 3 nanometer sized pores. And in most of our porous systems, that extent of determination is more than enough. You do not really need to go much further down. Now we saw earlier when we tried to use something like a scanning electron microscopy study for un understanding pore systems that we were severely restricted by the extent of resolution we can get at high magnifications. Right? When you want to use the backscatter system, we discussed that the highest magnification you can get probably is about 5000, 6000 x and not more than that. Now when you use a secondary electron imaging system, you can get 200,000, 300,000 but to understand the size and shape of a pore using secondary system will be very difficult. So you would rather use a backscatter system with a polished surface so that the pores are directly cut across to determine the size and shape of the pores. But because of the resolution difficulties, it becomes quite difficult to resolve pores that are anything smaller than maybe tenths of a micron. You can probably get 1 micron resolution easily in SEM, but going to less than tenth of a micron that is about 100 nanometers 
becomes very difficult with respect to scanning electron microscopy. But here with MIP you are actually reaching a pore range that can be detected up to 2, two to 3 nanometers. So, you are actually in a completely different scale with respect to SEM. You also have to be aware of when do you need to do this experiment. Okay. As I have uh, discussed several times before in this, uh, in this uh, course, the more sophisticated the technique, the more expensive it becomes right? and probably the less representative also it becomes. So, for example, if you want to just determine the pore structure for the purposes of understanding relative differences in water absorption by different concrete systems, right? what type of technique would you use? You may just stop with some macro level techniques like water absorption or sorptivity and that could actually give you substantial differences in different types of concrete without having to go through an MIP study or an SEM study to determine pore structure. So, all those become very complicated and expensive. SEM and MIP. So, you need to understand what is it that you are trying to resolve. However, now you are trying to resolve something like what happens to the pore structure of the paste when you reduce the water cement ratio or when you use a new type of binder. Now, the effect that you get on concrete with the help of sorptivity or absorption experiment is a bulk measurement and you may not be able to get the finer nuances of what happens at the paste level. For that, it is reasonable to go for a higher level investigation using scanning electron microscopy or mercury intrusion porosimetry. Now, of course, with MIP, we can go down to very small pore sizes, but you also have to understand that we are using a material that is highly toxic, mercury is highly toxic and because of this toxicity of the mercury and the fact that even at temperatures of more than 25 degrees Celsius, the vapors of mercury itself can cause toxicity. The usage of mercury is banned in several countries for such purposes. So, the mercury intrusion porosimeters, as I will show you, are very powerful devices to understand cementitious materials, but the usage of MIP is declining day by day because many countries are now banning mercury intrusion porosimetry as a technique because of the use of mercury. Okay. So, there may be a day when we cannot use this technique anymore, but in the next uh, segment I will show you as to what would be the significance of using MIP and how it actually helps us distinguish performance of different types of cementitious materials. Thank you.